everyone. I'm Lisa Muscatine, co-owner of Politics and Prose, and along with my husband and co-owner Brad Graham and our entire staff, we welcome you to PNP Live for what promises to be a truly wonderful evening. Um, as a bookseller, it's always a pleasure to host an event for a book that is timely, essential to reshaping the historical narrative, and beautifully done. And that's the case with the book we're featuring tonight, Awakening, Me Too, and the Global Fight for Women's Rights by Rachel Vogelstein and Megan Stone. The book is the first to capture the global impact of the Me Too movement and to explore how it caught fire in countries with different histories, cultures, political climates, and records on women's rights. Told through the eyes and experiences of women advocates on the ground in seven hot spots, Awakening confirms that women seeking recourse for sexual assault and harassment, lack of access to fair systems of justice, underrepresentation in politics, and grotesque attacks on their identity use new tools of technology to galvanize a worldwide movement. While optimistic, the book also contains a warning about the backlash against women's progress now flaring in country after country and what can be done to protect, preserve, and advance women's rights so fundamental to any fair and just society. And I just wanna say that as a measure of this book's importance, it's worth noting that Tarana Burke, the community organizer who helped spark the Me Too movement, wrote the introduction. I said at the outside that it's always a pleasure to help promote a book as worthy as this one, and it's an even greater pleasure and honor when one of the authors happens to be a former colleague and dear friend. Rachel Vogelstein is a lawyer, policymaker, scholar, teacher, and lifelong advocate for women's rights. She's currently the Douglas Dillon Senior Fellow and Director of Women and Forest po Foreign Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. And I had, this is by way of truth and advertising. I had the good fortune to sit across from Rachel in the headquarters, very dank headquarters of the Hillary for President campaign in 2008, where we communed on a daily basis, sharing our dream of helping to elect the nation's first woman president and becoming fast friends. Although that dream was deferred, Rachel went from the presidential campaign to serving in the Office of Global Women's Issues at the State Department under Secretary Clinton. She was also a member of the White House Council on Women and Girls. And working with Rachel in both the campaign and at state, I saw how she applied her intellect, creativity, humanity, and dedication to every project she undertook. And it is for all of these reasons and so many more that it just gives me total sheer joy to see her hard work now in book form. We're also thrilled that Rachel's wonderful co-author, Megan Stone, is with us tonight. Megan is a force of nature when it comes to fighting for the rights of women and girls. She's a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and for three years was president of the Malala Fund, one of the world's most influential nonprofits working to ensure that girls can go to school and do so safely. As an advocate, she served on the board of John Lewis's Bipartisan Faith and Politics Institute and led projects for Bono's One Campaign, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, and other global organizations. She was named one of the Fast Company's most creative people and was included on Elle Magazine's 2017 Women in Washington Power List. From every and any platform, Megan has worked tirelessly to help women fight for their rights, challenge outdated gender norms, and support, in her words, the global cause of women's dignity and freedom. Now, Megan, you can add being co-author of this wonder, wonderful book to your life's work. Last, but definitely never least, we are thrilled that our moderator for tonight's conversation is an expert on women's rights and an icon herself, Tina Chen. For those of you fluent in all things Barack and Michelle Obama, you know that Tina served as chief of staff to the first lady in the Obama administration, as assistant to the president and as executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Now, of course, she's president and CEO of Time's Up, the nation's leading organization working to change laws and cultures so that all women are treated fairly, with dignity and with respect for their safety in their workplaces. Tina is also featured in Rachel and Megan's book for starting the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund which has been emulated in countries around the world. You know, honestly, it is just such a thrill and an honor to have such an incredible lineup of champions for women in one Zoom screen uh, tonight for the next hour. We're really happy about this event. So delighted to have all of you here. And I hope the audience will join me in welcoming the three of you, Rachel, Megan, and Tina to PNP Live. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Um, it is my honor and privilege to be able to do this, you know, with Rachel and Megan. Um, it is a real pleasure and it was, I will get to the book in a moment, um, but, you know, just, just a, a wonderful occasion to, today to sort of see the book, see it 
out on Morning Joe this morning, now closing out my day uh, by doing this event for Politics and Prose, which was my favorite bookstore when I lived in DC for nine years um, and, and remains really one of the leading independent bookstores in the country. Um, so thank you, Lissa, so much. Um, look, Rachel and Megan are both two women that I have had the pleasure of working with for many years. You know, Rachel, you know, as we did all of our work, you know, in the Obama administration, you know, on, um, all of the global women's issues, issues, the international issues, the White House Council of Women and Girls. And then I have to also say that we have been very fortunate at Time's Up to have Rachel as an advisor on critical issues for Time's Up. So international issues, most recently, Rachel and I have been deep in working on military sexual assault and the Independent Review Commission work that was appointed by President Biden and Secretary Austin. And Megan and I got to know each other also when I was in the White House, when she was doing amazing work with Malala Yousafzai. She and I had to organize a very complicated trip and visit by Malala and her father to the White House in October of 2017. It was really complicated. I will tell the story here, Megan, of the fact that if those of you who are DC, you know, folks and know your DC history, you will remember that October 2017 was the month in which the, we were in a government shutdown for the failure to pass the 2018 bu the, the, the budget, you know, in, two in, in right, not 2017, but in 20, 2014, right? Um, and uh, Malala and her father came to the White House. There were only very few essential staff there. Um, people like me were left there who didn't actually know how to do all of the ways and entrance. So they were stuck at the gate in pouring rain for, at their meeting with the first lady first and then in the Oval with the first lady and the president and Malia Obama, which is the only meeting that Malia, Malia Obama actually asked to attend. She found out about it during her breakfast table conversation with her parents and asked to be at that meeting with Malala. And it was amazing. And it was that meeting that was the inspiration for our work with Mrs. Obama on Let Girls Learn to promote adolescent girls education, a project she continues and I continue to work with her on at the Obama Foundation through the Girls Opportunity Alliance. So this is a real pleasure. And then I've got to say a word about the book. The book is amazing. I mean, it first of all is someone who was involved at the start of Time's Up and Me Too in October of 2017 in those moments in you know seeing it, what we were doing here in the United States the opportunity to see that reflected around the globe through the eyes of the stories that you tell, the women who you bring to life in the book um, was incredible, you know, and I'm not sure I fully appreciated the scope of what was happening until I read the book. And, you know, you do it in such a way that tells individual stories and connects those to the history, connects those to a global movement in a seamless and incredibly elegant way. It's just beautifully written. Um, you know, it just, I went through it all at once because it just was so gripping as a read and timely as Lissa said. So one of the things I loved about the book, and I'm going to ask you to start there, is because it is a series of stories about women and their experiences, you each of you tell your story, you know, a, that particular moment for each of you that brought you to the book. And I wondered if you would, you know, sort of share briefly that part of the book to set the stage for how you came into this issue and how you talked about it. And Rachel, maybe if you could start. Sure, well, I wanna start first by saying thank you. You know, having an opportunity to launch this book, this labor of love at our absolute favorite bookstore in the world, Politics and Prose, is a dream come true. And Tina, you have been a legend on these issues for more years than I can count. We admire your work so much and it's an honor to have you with us tonight. Thank you for, for being here. You know, in the book, we write about what brought us to this story and for me, I had been working on the 2016 presidential campaign, as Lissa said, trying to live out the dream of electing the first woman president here in the United States, and was really surprised in the aftermath of that election to see this wave of women's activism, not only here in the United States, but around the world. If you think back to the 2017 Women's March, which was not only here in DC, it was on every continent and it was organized transnationally and digitally in only 10 weeks because of this 
rise in activism. And at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Women in Foreign Policy program team began to track this rise in activism. And we started to see not only an increase in the number of women raising their voices, starting with that Women's March, moving to the Me Too movement, which goes global starting in October of 2017, and then ultimately to an incredible rise in women's political participation in a broad range of countries from you know, Afghanistan to Brazil uh, to places in the Middle East that would surprise you. And we really were struck by this incredible wave and I actually had the opportunity to host uh, Nadia Murad, an Iraqi uh, women's activist, a survivor of sexual slavery at the hands of ISIS at the council where she was advocating against discrimination and sexual abuse against women and met with many activists on the margins of that meeting and began trading stories about this rise we were seeing around the world, but these stories were not being told in the American media. And so lucky for me, Megan uh, agreed to, to join together to write this together. And we took this journey around the world and that's how we get to awakening. And Megan, how about you? Well, first of all, thank you so much for just being way too effusive in your praise. I have to say it's high praise coming from someone like you, Tina. And I have to say, if you're an advocate, like you're so damn lucky if Tina Chen is the person sitting across the table from you when you're trying to advocate for girls and women. And it is not the case in a lot of countries when you go to those meetings that you get the honor and the opportunity to really work with somebody in government who really cares deeply about serving and it was really just such an extraordinary opportunity to work together. So what a gift to see you tonight. Thank you. Uh, I would say that, you know, this issue started to become real for me, you know, far before in just terms of working with human rights activists who are women, women human rights defenders. Too many times you will sit with a woman who has been working on human rights issues in her country. And it won't be the first conversation you have or the second, it'll be after you really get to know each other, after you start to spend time together, after they know that you're really in solidarity with them. You know, one night on a late night phone call or over dinner um, or after a big moment, you know, we'll start talking just as women. And I was just really struck by how many times I have had those conversations with women human rights defenders where they disclose that they had been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. Sometimes this is what the hands of their family members uh, when they were, you know, maybe as a girl trying to stand up for their rights. Sometimes it was deliberately used as a tool in their community to try to silence them for the work that they're doing. Other times it was just an act of violence and retribution, even from a government, um, you know, officer or official. And it's something that, you know, wasn't ever really talked about from the stage. You don't go to Davos, you know, and, and women are excited to get up and say that this has happened to them. You know, there's still so much shame and stigma and it is such a personal trauma, but it was something that I just found again and again. And so when the opportunity came to write this book with Rachel, it really was her idea to write this book. And she said, will you do this with me? And I said, can I bring the human rights perspective? And can I bring the digital organizing perspective? Because that's work that we did at Malala Fund that I've done in other roles, you know, both domestically and internationally. And so it was really just a pleasure to get to work together with her on this idea and on this book and go on this journey together. So I want to pick up with what you just said, Megan, because I was struck by this um, in the book and the thread around social media and the role of social media and the digital age we're in. You know, I have often said in answer to the question, you know, why October 2017 for Time's Up and Me Too, right? What was it? Because it's not like we didn't have Anita Hill 30 years previously. We haven't had other moments. Um, Rachel, you will painfully remember the 2016 campaign moment, right? Even with a videotape that was out there. And yet it did not spark this same wave. And I've often said it was, actually celebrities that we all thought we knew, whose faces we could recognize who were speaking out. But importantly, it was the role of social media, the ability to actually use Tirana's hashtag me to tell your story instead of just telling it to 10 people in your, in your close circle to be part of a community of thousands that fueled and put the velocity behind all of these women around the globe, multiple industries, different, you know, low income, high wage, you know, C-suite folks down to shop floor folks. Um, and you pick that up too. I see that thread throughout in each country, how social media actually made something exist that could not have happened perhaps in previous eras. Um, 
Can you talk about that? And maybe Megan, starting with you, you know, how you saw that thread and how it plays out in the book. You know, technology has been invaluable to this movement. And we saw that here in the United States and then also globally, you know, one of the great effects of this has been, it democratizes access to the movement and it creates the space overdue space for women of all backgrounds, all ethnicities, races, religions, socioeconomic status to actually have a fighting chance of being heard and to organize. And so we saw this all over the world, you know, and it's not a mistake, I think, that a lot of the the leaders, at least in the countries that I wrote about, places like Nigeria, Pakistan, Egypt, Tunisia, are mostly women in their early 20s to late 20s. You know, so many times in foreign policy, we think that you have to have multiple degrees and a lot of credentials to lead, you know, and these women are not those women. These are young women that just generationally understand the power of social media. It's also not a perfect tool. It doesn't mean there's not danger in that space still. It doesn't mean you can't receive threats in that way. Just because something goes viral doesn't mean that you can automatically translate into power in the real world in real time. But the most effective organizing I saw, and I think we both saw in the countries we wrote about, was when it was digital plus real time, right? So I think of in Nigeria, women organizing on WhatsApp, but then going to protest in person in front of their local parliaments, their state state houses to try to fight for laws as well. So that's, that's where it was most successful, much like we see here, right? In the United States, that's where organizing really, the rubber meets the road. Rachel, what did you see? I really agree. I mean, to contrast this moment with prior waves of the women's movement helps explain why we're seeing such rapid change in such a short period of time. You know, during earlier eras, victories were only won after lifetimes of organizing. It took more than a century for women globally to win the right to vote. It took decades to enshrine women's rights as human rights into international law. And today, thanks to advances in technology, The movement can mobilize millions across country lines in a matter of weeks or even days. And the diversity of the movement has also changed because of these 21st century tools. Anyone with access to an internet connection can participate and many have participated and that's helped women find new strength in numbers. You know, in some respects, the internet has become a 21st century public square for women, especially in places where their freedom is circumscribed and they can't gather safely in public, but they can post online anonymously. And the result is a global women's movement that's not only more powerful, but also more diverse than at any other point in history. So I wanna remind the folks who are listening that we are going to do audience Q&A. Before we finish this program, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens and put your questions in there. um, And we will save some time before the hour is up to get to those. Um, You know, one of the things I was struck by in the book was the courage of so many of these women um, and courage in ways that those of us in the United States, as hard as it is to be a survivor to speak out and as much courage as that takes, Um, We are not often risking being arrested, having our homes raided, um, you know, being being killed in many circumstances. And um, those stories of courage really stuck with me. And what I think is powerful about the book is to bring those to life. And I wonder if each of you might share, because I want folks who are listening to get a flavor of that power that is in the book, you know, tell us a bit about, you know, a particular woman who stood out for, for you in the book, in the work that you've done. Rachel, let's start with you. Well, there are so many, but I'll start with the courageous women who we write about from Brazil. You know, in Brazil, the hashtag MeToo is long predated by a campaign that is also digital and online. There is a, a hashtag used years before, Mayo Primero Assidio, which translates into my first harassment. It was created by Uh, an innovative activist, Juliana DeFaria, who used digital technology, not only to amass numbers of women, but also to help visualize electronically the pervasiveness of harassment and assault, creating an online platform so that women could post the locations of assaults on a map in real time, thereby dispelling the notion that this is only a problem in certain places or certain neighborhoods. And what was remarkable is that women in Brazil then began to turn campaigns against sexual harassment into campaigns for political power. And that gives rise to the remarkable election in Rio de Janeiro of a woman we write about named Marielle Franco, who's a black 
lesbian human rights activists from the urban slums known as the favelas who no one expects to win political power in a country that's largely controlled by wealthy white men. But then in 2016, she's elected in a landslide. And in the end, she pays the ultimate price for her advocacy. She's assassinated by those who oppose her commitment to end harassment and discrimination. But as her chief of staff said following her assassination, they thought that by killing her, that they buried her, but instead they planted a seed. And we see a record number of women and women of color in particular who were inspired by her decide to run for office. And ultimately in the ultimate rebuke to those who tried to silence her, women's voices grow louder than ever with women's political representation in the 2018 federal elections jumping from 10 to 15%. So, you know, there's still a very long road ahead particularly under Brazil's current president, Jair Bolsonaro, who has fought against women's rights tooth and nail. Uh, but Brazilian women are now assuming positions of power in record numbers, and that will give them the power ultimately to transform the agenda. And Megan, how about you? Well, first of all, I want to say this just speaks to your deep work in the space, Tina, that that was something that you wanted to talk about tonight. Now, I think it's really easy to feel removed from what's happening in these countries and to these women. We may read a news article or do policy analysis, but these are really women that are putting their lives and their bodies on the line, you know, and, you know, whether it was Malala, who I worked for previously, who, you know, as we all know, was, was brutally attacked and will deal with those uh, results of those attacks for the rest of her life you know, it's, it's not an uncommon story, you know, and I think of actually a woman named Mazen Hassan. She's a lawyer. She's in Egypt. She's in Cairo and she's very much in Cairo because she's on travel ban from the Al-Sisi regime. So of course the Al-Sisi government in Egypt, authoritarian, um, there's at least 40,000, they think political prisoners right now in jail, you know, in Egypt, this woman, Mazen, like she was part of the uprisings in 2011 and then was part of the group of women that tried to integrate gender into the constitution. What does that mean? Trying to make sure that the constitution asserted women's rights in a, in, in a new and important way. So, I mean, this is a woman who cared and continues to care deeply for her country. She wants to be of service. She noticed that women in Tahrir were being sexually assaulted uh, by government forces. And so she started trying to represent these women in court, started trying to help them as victims. What happened was Al-Sisi of course comes to power and she's been now designated an enemy of the state. She was actually formally charged in a court of law for the irresponsible liberation of women. This is literally a written charge in court documents. And in retaliation because the Al-Sisi regime sees her work around sexual harassment and assault, as a threat, why? Because she's really good at organizing, right? So if you're an authoritarian regime, a totalitarian regime, anybody that's really good at being a critic becomes a threat. And so she's considered a, a serious state threat by the CC regime. And she's now had all her assets frozen. Uh, she's had her organization, Nazra for Feminist Studies shut down and she can't leave the country. You know, And she says she would not change her decisions even today, knowing what She's done, and at any time she could be put in jail. Uh, you know, she could lose her life. You know, Egypt even announced last uh, few weeks public executions of political dissidents. So, like, this isn't you know theoretical policy differences. These are these are women who really are willing. They've made an emotional decision to pursue this work, no matter what the cost. It was it was that that courage just leapt out of the pages and and, and really sort of grabbed me. The, the other story. Uh, um, was struck by which I wonder if uh, one of you could tell is about sex for grades, you know, and that, 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 that moment in because it is something that my goodness, you know, as the mother of, you know, a, a, a young, a young woman, you know, I, I, I think about, um, I don't know which one of you wants to tell the sex for grades story because that's, that's incredible. I can tell that one because I wrote about the Nigeria chapter uh, that this one was another one where like young women were just out with raw hustle and digital organizing, you know, women with no power to draw upon literally collectively came together. And the cool thing is that this movement started in the north. It started with Muslim women in northern Nigeria and Kaduna state where, you know, early forced marriage is a huge issue where women's rights are really facing tremendous obstacles where Boko Haram is, is active. And they started Ariwa Me Too, Ariwa being the Hausa word for North. And a woman in the South saw this hashtag, 
uh, Fakria Hashem, and she started interacting with the woman, Khadija Adamu, in the North, who first posted about her experience. This starts to catch fire, and it spreads to a university called Unilag, which is kind of like the Harvard of Nigeria. I mean, this is where you dream of sending your daughter, you know, if she is going to make her way in the world. Well, lo and behold, these women work so hard to pursue their education so they can have a career and have agency. They get to school and there's just systemic sexual harassment and abuse by professors at the university. And so it's sex for grades. Unless you sleep with your professor, you will be failed. And a lot of women, you know, feel like they're going to let down their families. This is their generational opportunity for breakthrough. And so there's a huge power differential. Everybody knew about it. Open secret. They start organizing. And there's this amazing journalist named Kiki Morty, who's a freelance journalist with BBC Africa. And she convinces the powers that be to give her cash money and time to go investigate this for a year. And so she gets these under uh, age and over the age of 18 um, students to wear mics and go undercover and record their professors. Um, so all their complaints had gone nowhere. But once there's footage, hard to dispute. And so these, these professors were removed and then it led to Nigeria passing explicit specific laws to, to say that there should be a prohibition against university professors sexually harassing and assaulting their students. And it was a huge scandal in Nigeria and it led to real change. It led to concrete change. So, you know, again, this was a group of young women using media, digital organizing, creativity and courage really to create systemic change. And lest we think this is a developing world or global South issue, you know, it's not. And your book is brilliant in making that point. Obviously, we're dealing with it and we continue to deal with it in the United States. It's constant. It still sometimes amazes me that three and a half years post Harvey Weinstein, you still have story after story of powerful men who continue to do this and continue to you know, be exposed doing it. And we don't have sufficient you know, systems in place as the Bill Cosby release, you know, and sort of graphically illustrated for us a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, you know, Rachel, I think, tell us the story about Sweden, because I think, you know, laying out Sweden, who typically we're all talking about the Scandinavians, right, as having gender parity and, the, you know, that the, we, we hold them up as the folks who are sort of doing gender right in some ways. And yet, you know, the, the, the just the the tenacity of the patriarchy, right, of hanging on even in places like that, you know, I think we see in what you write about about Sweden. You know, the the chapter on Sweden really speaks to the importance of social norm change. Sweden is a place that has some of the strongest laws in the world, Tina, as you suggest, to promote and advance gender equality. And yet they had an enormous Me Too movement and the country was really shocked. There was an awakening in Sweden to the scale and the scope of the problem there. Women were incredibly creative in Sweden in their organizing. They decided rather than outing individual men that they would amass women anonymously online and focus on this issue as one of systemic discrimination instead of the way it's often portrayed and certainly has been in this country as the case of a few individual bad apples. They organized across 65 different industries to show that this was truly pervasive in all parts of Swedish society. And they also used humor. They used clever hashtags to help their campaign go viral. So the restaurant workers posted under, we are boiling with rage. And the healthcare workers posted under a hashtag that translates to now it will really hurt. Uh, the unions, posted under not negotiable. And these humorous hashtags really helped the movement take off. But in this chapter, we tell the story of a woman named Cici Valin, who bravely ignites the Me Too movement in Sweden by posting about her own experience with assault in which she names her alleged attacker in part because she had gone to the police years before and nothing was done with the complaints that she filed. So after seeing the Me Too movement go viral in the United States, she decides to post. And ultimately, even though many other women come forward with disturbingly similar accusations against the man that she accused, she ends up being sued by her attacker for defamation. And ultimately, he won. Cece was sentenced to pay him damages for the injury that she caused to his reputation. This is a tactic that we see employed by powerful men around the world. And it shows how our justice systems 
still cry out for reform. No, absolutely. I mean, that was the impetus for the creation of the Times of Legal Defense Fund was, you know, Brett Ratner's lawyer, you know, you know, trying to, you know, silence Melanie Kohler by threatening her with defamation right in the wake of the, you know, Weinstein reporting when Melanie wrote about Brett Ratner's rape of her on face on using the hashtag me too. And we feared that would shut the whole thing down right then because that is part of, you know, as Catherine Powell just put in, it's not just the Harvey Weinstein playbook. I call it the predators playbook because it's there around the world, you know, and on that theme of sort of playbooks, but also backlash, you know, that backlash theme, in addition to the social media theme and the courage theme, there is the backlash theme that comes up. And we've touched upon it a little bit, you know, in some of these stories. Um, what did the two of you observe, I think, you know, in this global movement and the resulting backlash and, did you come away with things that we could do about that, you know, in this moment? Now, Megan, let me, let's start with you. I'll tell you what, I, I actually have a quote above my desk from Frederick Douglass that power concedes nothing without a fight. And I always look at it whenever I feel just kind of dispirited in trying to do human rights work, social change work, because it is not going to be an easy road. So I can't tell you how many times many of my well-meaning male colleagues have said to me, they're like, well, there's so much backlash. So therefore this, this, this movement can't be successful. You know, and I always say to them, interesting, thank you. You know, could you tell me the social movement that achieved systemic change to which there was no backlash? I'll wait. There's no answer. There, there is no movement <laughs> that has achieved anything without having some backlash, you know. And so, you know, I think the women we've spoken with are very clear eyed. They know exactly, uh, you know, what is is coming in response to them. And it takes every form from, you know, I think of Mayel Shami in Egypt, who was one of the first women to bring forth a sexual harassment case in Egyptian court. And she was not only removed from her role and fired, you know, she was threatened with, you'll never get a job in media again, because she worked at a state supported media company, you know, all the way to, uh, you know, women in Pakistan who experience incredible backlash, the women that organized the Arat March, which just means woman in Urdu, uh, a lot of them, even this weekend, were WhatsApping me because uh, we were in deep relationship with all these women. And they were like, you know, we're worried because a lot of us have had to go into hiding uh, because of, you know, suits that were filed. After the march, one local parliament in Pakistan actually tried to put forward legislation to ban women to gather in the street to ever have a march again. But a lot of them went into hiding. And this tragically was because uh, they included the LGBT community as part of their platform for the rights. They actually marched with transgender uh, Pakistani women, you know, and so like there's incredible work that's happening, very brave work, but the backlash is real. But I think we know, think of even the civil rights movement in the United States or Black Lives Matter right now, you know, that's happening in terms of racial equity and justice, of course, there's gonna be backlash. Uh, but that doesn't mean the work isn't successful. We would argue, and we do in the book, that means that it's it's making progress and that's why there's so much pushback. Rachel, you wanna add anything here? Yeah, I'll add that not only do we recognize the backlash, we outline a prescription for action to ensure that the remarkable progress we've seen over just three years continues. And this is an agenda that's informed by women leaders on the front lines, and we've come to refer to it as the five R's, and they are redress for survivors, reform of the law, representation for women, resources for implementation, often overlooked, and a recalibration of social norms. And we maintain that this agenda will not only help women speak up to demand their rights, but also help ensure that they have the power to actually implement them. And you know, at the top of the agenda of almost every Me Too activist we interviewed around the world is this idea of redress, of justice for survivors of sexual assault and harassment. Tina, I know that's what you are working on day in and day out here in the US. And there's a universal demand for that. And for centuries, in every part of the world, people accused of sexual abuse, especially those with the most power, have really had the legal system tipped in their favor while the reputations and integrity of survivors have been put on trial. And this injustice helps explain why before this online movement offers both anonymity and strength in numbers that so few women were willing to come forward to name what was plainly happening all around us. So delivering justice for survivors is a cornerstone of this agenda, and it requires a functioning and a balanced legal system, one that certainly protects the rights of accused, 
the accused, but also protects the rights of survivors, and that's free from discrimination and from stereotypes about women. Yeah, you have an amazing statistic that I will say is as active as I am, I only just learned, you know, in it that, um, what is it, 50 countries around the world still do not have any laws prohibiting sexual harassment or addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. And that 58% of the countries actually don't have any laws that outlaw marital rape. Um, so, you know, we both have that going on, but I will say again, you know, we've seen over and over again, how even what we think of as a developed legal system here in the United States has so far to go on these issues. You know, we've got like lots of questions coming in. I wanna to turn to a couple of these so that we have time. Um, Sarah has asked, um, we saw high profile cases like Harvey Weinstein, which revolved around celebrities calling out his atrocious behavior. I love the example Megan gave of Nigeria, but I'm wondering is um, in other instances in the developing world where the women calling out their abusers might be more economically vulnerable, how are the women of privilege being allies? Which I think is a great question because that's something we see here in the United States. And that's been one of our strengths is women of privilege actually actually reaching out and across industries and across economic lines. Did you see that happening elsewhere? I'm happy to start. You know, I would think we saw this in many of the countries that we write about. And I'll just mention uh, an anecdote from Brazil. You know, in Brazil, there was actually at the height of the online protests uh, on sexual harassment uh, under the Mayo Primero Assidio, my first harassment hashtag, there was this unbelievable phenomenon where the journalism industry, which is dominated by men there as it is in many other parts of the world, um, suddenly we had see editors in Brazil interested in what women are protesting about online and in the streets. And so editors that previously refused to print articles about sexual harassment in their papers suddenly want to know more. And one of the activists that we interviewed there, Manuela Miklos, I remember laughing with her in a cafe in Sao Paulo because she said the men kept calling her up from the newspapers and saying, women are trying to say something. How can we hear them? And then she would open the paper and she would just see mail byline after mail byline after mail byline. So she came up with this idea to take over the journalism industry. And so she goes with her colleague, uh, Antonia Pellegrino, who is also uh, a privileged white woman who is politically connected. They know a lot of these male journalists. They went from journalist to journalist and convinced them to let women take over their columns. And you have this unbelievable wave. But when they did it, they insisted that the women who wrote in place of the men would be a diverse group of women. In fact, Marielle Franco, the woman I talked about earlier, this Afro-Brazilian lesbian human rights activist ends up writing three times. Uh, initially, they had been asked to write these columns themselves and they insisted on not doing that. They could see the strength that the movement would gain by taking an inclusive and a diverse an approach to their work. So it was incredible. And I remember for those of you who follow uh, soccer, uh, that their best story was when the man who authored the most prominent blog in all of Brazil, which naturally is about soccer, uh, created an opportunity after the final match of the World Cup for women to talk about what had happened to them. So all of these men logging on, expecting to find a post-game analysis, actually found a really moving story that included this journalist's own daughter and her sharing experiences that she had never been public about before. But that diversity really helped characterize the Me Too movement in Brazil right from the get-go. No, oh, I loved that story and the soccer piece of it I remember well. And it also tells a story not just of women of privilege, which was the question, but also male allies, right? And how male allies can step up. Uh, Megan, did you have a sort of another example or something else of women uh, or men, right? Reaching out to be allies you know, across various lines of division. I actually have one that's a shout out to you at Time's Up, uh, <laughs> which is so cool. I mean, like it's such a gift to 
get to work with women in so many different contexts who are doing this work and who get inspired by each other. And that, you know, in the book, we talk about this, the transnational nature, it's like popcorn, you know, it's, it's bouncing from country to country. And when a woman feels like in her mission that she's trying to pursue in her context, defeated or deferred, you know, she, she's looking to other women in other countries to take lessons or inspiration or steal tactics. I mean, this is what good organizing is about, right? Um, but I think about in Pakistan, actually, in Pakistan, they started a uh, similar thing. Actually, it was Misha Shapi, who's a very famous kind of Bollywood style actress, came forward and made allegations against another very favorite, uh, famous actor in Pakistan. And she started doing things like going and marching in the Orat March and speaking to the everyday women who had gathered from all walks of life. Um, women came to that march who worked in the markets. Women who were domestic laborers came to that march. And it was really important to the march organizers who were you know, a lot of them lawyers, journalists, all Pakistani women, but, you know, women who had benefited from a lot of privilege in terms of education and resources. It was very important to them that the march was incredibly welcoming and making sure it was recruiting women from all kinds of backgrounds to come and come together. Because obviously, socioeconomic disparity in that community is very, it, it's a wide breadth, right? You know, so that happened. Then Nigat Dad, who's one of the lawyers in Pakistan, starts her version of Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which is just Time's Up in Urdu. And it's because many women simply can't afford a lawyer. I mean, it's hard to afford a lawyer in the United States, you know, as you know well from all the women uh, that you've represented at the Defense Fund. But, you know, it's it's a huge barrier for a woman in Pakistan. It's insurmountable almost, especially when a court system doesn't function, right? You could have a case in front of the court there for years and years and years and years, right? That happens here in the US too, by the way. But you know, it was a model that really Tina, you and your colleagues pioneered, but like what a gift to be able to go sit with activists in Pakistan and go, oh, wow, like I see this connected, the connective tissue between these two movements is so real and so undeniable. Oh, it was incredible. It, it was actually, you know, it's, it's something for me to sit, you know, sit, sit in my house in Chicago and read about. It was, it was incredible, which is what's so great about this book. Um, uh, another question that we've got is from Katie. Uh, we see that women disproportionately lost their jobs due to the pandemic, most specifically women of color. As the economy starts to bounce back, do you anticipate men in power exploiting women's more desperate need for work? And perhaps we'll see a surge in workplace harassment. Well, COVID has revealed, as we have seen, and many of us lived through deep structural inequities showing that women have less power in the workplace. Uh, and Tina, you're leading the charge on addressing these issues. At Time's Up, women are already saddled with an unequal burden of caregiving, and they saw their responsibilities multiply around the world as schools and childcare centers close, doing an average of three times more unpaid work than men, we saw rates of intimate partner violence skyrocket as many women were forced to shelter at home with their abusers. And we saw female dominated industries such as hospitality, food service, retail were especially vulnerable, which fuels this unbelievable exodus of women from the labor force in the US. Three million women, disproportionately women of color lost their jobs, which has sent female labor force participation to a 33 year low. And globally, although women comprise only 39% of workers in the formal labor force, they suffered the majority of job losses during the pandemic. So we know that there's a power imbalance and this pandemic has really put that in stark relief. And anecdotally, you know, we did a little work on this at the Council on Foreign Relations. We were hearing an increase from women about a rise in online harassment. And one important tool in combating that is a new convention from the International Labor Organization, Convention 190, which addresses harassment in the world of work. And it includes online harassment. And there's a lot that can be done as countries begin to ratify that convention to start to include online harassment as a form that needs to be addressed. But I'll also add that Began and I found that at the height of the pandemic, which is when we were writing this book, that women continue to come out in record numbers on these issues. Argentinian women, for example, who began protesting against gender-based violence long before Me Too under a hashtag called Ni Una Menos, which means not one less, they donned face masks and they organized marches and they ultimately leveraged their newfound political power into a successful push to legalize abortion. 
a victory that has ripple effects across Latin America today. And at the same time, we saw women in Iran, one of the most oppressive places in the world to be a woman. They rose up to join sisters around the world to also say me too and voiced allegations of sexual abuse against a prominent Iranian man who is now known as the Harvey Weinstein of Iran. And then that ultimately leads the government to consider a groundbreaking bill to criminalize sexual assault and harassment. So while the pandemic has certainly undermined women's participation in the economy, it hasn't quieted women's voices. And as we begin to get the pandemic under control and reopen economies and the market, then we should expect to see women's voices continue to rise. Well, I will add a little bit of a plug myself, but just because it's exactly right. We are seeing this moment in this post-pandemic moment. Um, we know that, you know, harassment didn't go away. The likelihood that it will increase, you know, is very real, you know, as, as you know, women are, are not part of the recovery right now. We're seeing it even as the recovery is happening, you know, women's, you know, unemployment rate continues to be high. They're coming back, especially for black and brown women. Um, and, you know, one of the things, you know, as, as, Rachel and Megan know um, I'm here looking a little washed out <laughs> in our DC office, even though I live in Chicago, because I came to DC today to be part of the caregiving, you know, day day of action, you know, across the country to really call for the enactment of the Build Back Better plan from the Biden administration that really lays out a comprehensive caregiving infrastructure set of investments for the public sector. And tomorrow, time's up, we are doing an event with Secretary Raimondo at the Department of Commerce and you know the near over 300 businesses that have joined our Care Economy Business Council of Time's Up to support caregiving and to do more as employers. Because look, you know the way to combat har harassment, right, to make sure we build workplaces where doesn't happen in the first place is to break down the power structures that currently exist, which means breaking down the structures that keep women and LGBTQIA and disabled and people of color out of the workplace, out of staying in the workplace and rising to the levels and to power that they are able to. And right now, caregiving is at a crisis. We see it and the figures that Rachel just laid out. And so, you know, my, my bit of a plug right now to all the listeners is this is the moment right now to make sure that you use your voice, you know, to let people know that, you know, um, including elected officials, that caregiving is important to you. It's not a red or blue issue. You know, red states are suffering as well as blue states, the families in those, we know that from all of the polling. And it's, it's really, really at a critical juncture. And this is all tied up. All of these issues are completely interconnected, which again, the beauty of the book is it really, um, it, it really shows, shows that. Um, you know, another question that I see that just came in, which is, you know, I think many of us who are reading the latest news see, um, and it's a little bit outside the geographic sphere of the book, but I know both of you have experience in this, is um, uh, VJ Liberatory Sarah says, how will women's voices not be completely crushed and silenced by the Taliban's resurgence in Afghanistan and what's going on in Afghanistan? And I know this was weighing on many of us um, as we see the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. You know, either one of you, you know, uh, maybe jump in to address that. Well, I'm happy to jump in. You know, it's really critical that the Biden administration advocate for the meaningful participation of women in every process in Afghanistan. You know, the situation on the ground, we know from the headlines, is incredibly fraught. There are attacks happening around the country. And of course, it's particularly dangerous for women who have been under assault. But I would note that just as the Me Too movement has changed social norms in so many places in just a few short years, Afghanistan today is a different place than it was 20 or 30 years ago. It has a constitution. Girls have returned to school. Women are in the workplace. That's the Afghanistan of today. And so for the country to be in good standing in the international community, women's fundamental rights cannot and should not be taken away. My understanding is that the Biden administration is focused on the safety and security of women in this transition, which quite frankly, they need to be. They need to ensure financial support and assistance to women's organizations on the ground. They need to provide safety for the women who have been vocal in fighting against the Taliban, and that includes visas. 
and they need to include women in conflict resolution, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it is the smart and strategic thing to do, because doing so will advance the long-term stability of that nation. I would just add, I sure wish the Taliban cared about being in good standing internationally. <laughs> you know, it's, um, you know, I think this just gets to the heart of where are women's issues geopolitically. You know, when the Trump administration began this process in the way that they did, they basically just gave away the farm. You know, there, there was so little um, good diplomacy that went into starting this, you know, and we all can look back and see how this all began. You know, but it, it left us unable to to advocate or try to set any real terms in terms of how we would uh, disengage or, you know, what had to be guaranteed. We really just, you know, really gave it all away, you know, and so like we can't be surprised that women yet again, you know, are left hanging in the lurch, you know, their interests weren't protected. Um, you know, I think this is one of the challenges that, you know, I know a lot of us are, are very close uh, friends and colleagues with a lot of Afghan women because, uh, a lot of these activists have come to Washington, D.C. and worked together, you know, at the Malala Fund. One of the last programs that I worked on that I was so proud to, to contribute to was setting up a funding relationship to support um, Teach for Afghanistan, you know, and make sure that we were giving real direct funding, not to large international organizations, but to local leaders, to women themselves in the communities. And, you know, that work was really promising. But I mean, right now to be a woman in Afghanistan who is educated, who is part of the media, I mean, it's to, it's to literally have a target, you know, on you. And, you know, it just yet again, it's, I'm humbled to see what women are willing to continue doing to fight for themselves, to fight for their communities. It's really humbling, you know, and I, I wish that in DC more policymakers spent time with these women because I think they would talk about policy very differently. You know, at think tank events, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to discussions on Afghanistan. I went to one, there was one other woman in the audience and she was Afghan and the moderator called on every other man in the room before they called on her. You know, when they called on her, she just crushed it. You know, she obviously had the knowledge, you know, deeply of what her community needed. But I think sometimes geopolitically, and especially when we start to talk about security or talk about conflict, you know, women's issues are just pushed to the side. They're collateral, they're collateral damage. You know, like they're not, they're not considered central and they need to be, we need to change that. No, absolutely. And, and I echo everything that you've said about these amazing women that we've all met um, from Afghanistan over the last um, couple of decades. Um, Megan, Latricia is asking that, you know, you mentioned the backlash the movements received. Um, why do you think it is difficult for society to believe and stand with women who are victims of sexual harassment? I'm so glad you got to Latricia because I saw her question pop up and she was very, she was in there a couple of times. So I'm so glad your question got asked. Um, I think these are just hard issues. You know, it's 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 hard to talk about. It's hard to talk about, you know, and you know, sometimes the men who perpetrate these actions are men that we know. They're men that we love. They're men that we work with. You know, how many times have we seen bold face names in in some of the stories that have come out part of the Me Too movement that we thought were allies. You know, we thought these were men who are on side. Uh, you know, and these are powerful men, you know, they're men who have incredible financial interests. They're men, I mean, Harvey Weinstein, why was everyone so quiet for so long? They wanted to make sure that their work could continue and they know he could destroy careers, he could destroy companies, you know, he could destroy so much just by simply taking offense and having a grudge, you know, and so, you know, the power dynamic always, right? But I also think it's a shame, you know, it's a shame that we still continue to put on women for for, for daring to speak up and say that like I was assaulted. Why do we see if a human rights activist is attacked in the street and beaten to a pulp, somehow I feel like people are more easily able to interact with that than understanding that a, a female human rights defender could be sexually assaulted. Um, you know, I'll just say personally, I just closed in the book that I myself am a survivor and we had to do media training and the media trainer was kind of looking out for us. And she was like, well, what's gonna happen if someone asks you if you were a victim of sexual assault? And I would say, I'm so grateful that I've gotten counseling and recovery and the tools that we advocate for in this book and that Tarana Burke advocates for in her survivor's agenda so that I can simply say that was part of my experience. So hopefully other women can feel safe to come forward and fight too. But I think we need to remove the stigma. We just have to, and we have to say that a lot of women, all kinds of women experience this. 
So as we're coming up in the last minute, you know, few minutes here, I just want to have one final question to each of you. And Kirsten sort of had a, you know, a, a version of it, which is, you know, really what can we do? And especially we women in the United States, you know, um, a quick recommendation that each of you has, you know, for what we can do to address globally, you know, gender-based violence, sexual harassment and sexual assault that are happening around the world to women. Um, and Megan, let's start with you and then end with Rachel. Yeah, I'd say just two quick things. Number one, if you go in the book, in the back, there is a list of all the women's organizations, the women that we interviewed and leaders in each of the countries and globally organizations like UN Women, the Global Fund for Women. And then if you are inspired, please don't just be inspired. That would be a failure of this book. We want you to do something with this knowledge and to actually partner with these women so you can actually support them directly yourself. The second thing I would say is just as ever, you know, we're in DC speak to your elected leaders, you know, and say that you want to prioritize how we invest foreign aid in women-led organizations, locally women-led organizations. Um, and then, hey, let's think twice about how we fund aid and give military assistance to countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia that are repeat offenders on human rights and especially on women's rights. So you can take action directly today, and then you can also make your voices heard with elected leaders. That's a great list to start with. And I will add one more to do item on the agenda, uh, which relates to the, the fifth R that's in our five R agenda. And that relates to the recalibration of social norms. Challenge harmful and discriminatory norms that you hear espoused by family, by friends, when you hear jokes or stereotypes about the veracity of women who come forward about sexual abuse challenge them. If you hear people questioning the likability or the relatability of women seeking positions of power, challenge them. You know, shifting attitudes about sexual abuse mm -hmm. and women's power and leadership is so critical to addressing this broader power imbalance in which sexual abuse flourishes. Great. Well, thank you. It was a real pleasure and opportunity. I really recommend the book to everybody who is uh, listening and watching this. And Alyssa, I will turn this back over to you. Well, what an amazing hour of conversation. And we are so grateful and inspired to have the three of you. I mean, truly among the world's leading experts on this who, you know, in your, your dedication, your own courage, your humanity on this issue, your persistence and your strength is so inspiring to so many people, certainly to me. And um, what a joy to have all of you. And Tina, you better be careful. You are so good at moderating. You are, <laughs> you know, we're, you're, you're, you're gonna be back at you. So, you know, you better move far away if, uh, if you don't wanna do this again. You did such a wonderful job and Megan and Rachel, um, Again, congratulations on the book. It's just, it's absolutely fabulous. It's so important. Everybody needs to read it. And by the way, people, it's not really long. It doesn't take a long time to read it. And it has amazing stories in it. So it's a great read, as Tina had said earlier. Um, also, is this not the best cover? I love this cover. And if you haven't actually picked up the book yet, when you do, buy it. And you can find the link on our Web, on the chat link here and on our website, you'll also see all the different hashtags from around the world that have been used as part of the global Me Too movement, which is, is just a very, it's just a beautiful cover and it really speaks to um, kind of the essence of the book so well. Um, I did also wanna say, which I should have said at the outset of the evening that I, uh, we owe huge thanks to our partners and friends at the New Republic who co-sponsored this event. And um, we're so grateful um, to have that partnership with them for this. And anyway, everybody buy this book and buy it for every person you know, not just women. Men need to read it also. Um, it's fabulous. Uh, congratulations again. We will do our utmost to help it get into the world and around the world and out in the world. And um, again, thank you all. Thank you to our audience for joining in to hear this conversation. Uh, we really appreciate it uh, that you're uh, sharing these events with us. And I just wish everyone a safe summer. Stay well and stay well read. Good night, everyone. Good night.